Welcome to an episode of InRange. I want to talk to you today about something I call the interim period of the Old West. And it's something that seems to be unaddressed. And questions I received from a photo that I posted from the recent Deadeye Division at CQB Brutality really instigated this. And it made me think, wow, this is a topic that needs to be discussed. Um, and in Deadeye, I shot two different times. I shot Old Old West and New Old West. And that's not the point of today's video. But in the Old Old West Division, I shot all black powder. And I shot an 1866 Winchester with cartridges, as you can see by this cartridge belt laying on the table. And then I shot percussion revolvers. And the fact that I had percussion revolvers with a cartridge belt, which the picture was the, cart the revolver shoved into my belt as a holster of sorts, Mexican carry. A lot of people were confused. They're like, why is there a percussion revolver with a cartridge belt? And that's the interim period. And that's what I was trying to represent at the time. So... I want to talk about a little bit about the gear that we see on the table, and I want to talk about that situation that existed, let's say, and again, this is somewhat subjective, but 1860, so I'm going to go ahead and go all the way up to around 1880, and I'll explain why. But, of course, during the Civil War, some people just were not embroiled in the conflict, and they went west to get away from it. Some people deserted on both sides of the conflict. And, in, and when the war ended in 1865, in many instances, many of the men took their equipment with them. Whether it was a percussion revolver, be it a dance revolver from the Confederacy or an 1860 Army, and they took maybe their holster with them or even their saber belt. And in doing so, the west of that time and the frontier of that time was mostly armed with weapons and surplus from a war that produced an innumerable amount of weapons and surplus. But at the same time, you also used what you could get. So what that boils down to, when we look at 1865, at this point there are cartridge weapons. And what I mean by this is self-contained cartridges. We're talking about a piece of brass or that has or copper in that regard that is either rim fire or center fire, although at this time we're talking rim fire, uh, with a bullet powder and a rim fire priming compound, all self-contained in one little piece, versus the paper cartridges or loose ball and powder and percussion cap that you would see in this dance revolver. But the reality was the pistols of the day weren't yet there. Now, there were some cartridge revolvers on the market. Most of them were really tiny little things that were backup pieces like the Smith & Wesson Type 1 and 1 and a half, which were a 22 short and a 32 rim fire. Strictly backup pieces. But if you were going to the frontier, you were going to want some more firepower than that. So in that regard, this dance revolver, or an 1860 Army, or for that matter, a Star revolver, anything you could really get your hands on was going to be probably sufficient as long as you could get your hands on it. But at this point, there were not really cartridge revolvers, not in the volume and in the availability that we would want for being able to go to the frontier with something capable of self-defense. So in that regard, you really were left when it came to cartridges with the 1860 Henry, chambered in 44 Henry rimfire, and in 1866, Winchester, of course, modified the Henry into the 1866 Winchester, which is really an 1860 Henry with a handguard and a better loading system called the Kingsgate patent, but still in 44 Henry rimfire, a self-contained cartridge. So at that point, you needed to have some way to keep cartridges on your person, which were, of course, the best thing to have in terms of uh, availability of reloading and reliability in the field, but there was a good chance that your sidearm would still be a percussion revolver. In fact, if you had a sidearm, it would have been a percussion revolver. So you, you could very well have a cartridge belt filled with 44 Henry rimfire on your belt, but you would also have a percussion revolver on your side. Now, when you're out in the field, you use what you can find or you use what is best for the field. And in that regard, when I, used my, when I made my impression of the old, old west, I actually used these Apache moccasins that I got from a custom made for me in a store in Tucson called Desert Sun, by the way, Desert S-O-N, and they manufacture the moccasins for many of the tribal nations across this country, and one of the ones that they can get are Apache, and since I'm representing the New Mexico Territory at that time, uh, it would be viable and possible that a person would acquire uh, Apache moccasins over and above maybe their surplus boots that they had that fell apart, or you might actually prefer them. And so in my impression of the old, old west, I'm using these Apache moccasins. And all that together starts talking to how the in interim period of the old west really was for the people that were willing to go and have those adventures um, and potential danger face them. So 
a good example of that, for example, is this. This is a um, reproduction, but this is a reproduction of a surplus Union side 1860 Colt uh, holster. It's a flap holster, really good in terms of retention and protection. But you'll see that the uh, slot on the back here is actually only sized to fit the regulation U.S. Army Sabre belt. And therefore, if you have a cartridge belt or a money belt, this is actually a money belt, um, it won't fit. You can't get this holster on that belt, at least not in a way that's good. So this is actually a real thing, both in the military and in the civilian field. They took that same holster, you can see it's really the same thing, and they modified it with a flap in the rear. And this actually became a regulation piece, but also a piece you'd see customized in the field, and took an 1860 Colt holster and made it so that it was essentially a Mexican-style loop holster to fit cartridge belts and money belts of the time. So this is a very industrious way that you'll see people using surplus equipment and turning it into something viable for the situation they're in now. And that's the holster I used for the match, and in fact, it's very historically accurate in that it holsters butt forward, which is a very unusual draw stroke. When you pull it out, you have to turn it around. But that was the Army regulation of the time, and it actually made sense when you were dealing with 7.5 inch and 8 inch barrels that uh, you could pull it up and it actually was easier to get it out of the holster and turn it with a barrel of that length. Of course, over the time, we will see people reduce their barrel lengths to five and a half or even four and three quarters or shorter to remove that problem. And we'll see holsters change for quicker access and we'll see flaps frequently disappear. But in that interim period, that period between 1860 and I'm going to go with 1880, this kind of stuff was prolific and military surplus was prolific. And it was highly likely you might be finding yourself in Apache boots with a money belt filled with 44 Henry rimfire with a cartridge we're firing 1860 or 1866 lever action, but your sidearm might very well and probably was a percussion revolver. So in 1870, 1871, you see Colt doing things like making conversions, uh, Richard Mason conversions, where they're starting to convert 1860 Colts and other people are converting other guns to cartridge. And you start seeing them producing the very first production run of Colt cartridge revolvers, the 1871-72 open top. Um, those were also generally chambered in 44 Henry rimfire. Um, and that's the very first instance you'll see in which the revolver and the lever action rifle on your side are chambered in the same cartridge. However, the 1871-72 open top really didn't see a very large production run, and Colt immediately went in 1873 to the single action army, and of course introduced, introduced into the field the 45 Colt cartridge. However, the thing that I found interesting in the comments and I see in, uh, a seems like a misunderstanding upon some people watching this kind of Old West content, is that the minute the 1871 open top appeared, suddenly these percussion revolvers disappeared off the earth and no one used them anymore. Or the minute the single action army came onto the field with the uh, 45 Colt, the percussion revolvers suddenly became irrelevant and gone. And while modern technology will make us refer to maybe a percussion revolver in 1873 as obsolescent, it does not make it obsolete. And in that regard, many people that already had a percussion revolver on their hip or had one for self-defense in their nightstand saw absolutely no reason whatsoever to try to spend the money or spend the resources or even to customize or modify their gun to a cartridge when they had absolutely no need for that whatsoever. And in fact, in one example of how long these weapons stayed in use in the field is this Confederate dance revolver. The Confederacy didn't manufacture many of their own revolvers. They used mostly captured weapons or stuff that they could import or smuggle in during the war. But they did make a small amount of domestic, let's say, domestically manufactured weapons. And this is a reproduction, but the dance revolver was one of them. And they didn't make many. We're not talking thousands here. We're talking a very small number. But yet we still find a picture of Geronimo himself uh, in the Wild West show, of course, after the conflict was over for him uh, and the, his subsequent surrender, he went to the Wild West show and was um, kind of an American folk hero in spite of the fact that before that he was the despised enemy. Um, there's a picture of him with a Civil War era Confederate percussion dance revolver. And we're talking 1890s here. And so this is an example, as I said, 1890s, 1910s, 1920s, these types of guns were still in use. There were a lot of people that saw no reason to change them out. And this picture of Geronimo 
with a Confederate dance revolver is a good indication of that. If you had a lever action on your side that chambered 13 rounds, or if you had a full length lever action that chambered 18 plus one rounds, your six shot percussion revolver on your hip was merely backup to your primary weapon, which was your long arm. Long arms at the time also included shotguns, and those were also, of course, paper and brass hole cartridges too. So those were self-contained cartridges as well. But the idea that suddenly when something new comes out that the old stuff just disappears when there is an enormous amount of it in the field, not only from surplus from the war on both sides of the conflict, but people have had and used them reliably for decades, and they have comfort in the gun they already know how to use. The idea that they're suddenly going to shift overnight to the newfangled cartridges, even though they understand it's better, is unrealistic. And it's not like the modern day where you would go to the local sports and warehouse and just buy another gun. People made what they had and their income was what they had. And on the frontier, that could be scarce and difficult, or you could strike it rich. But for the most part, the resources were narrow and thin. And therefore the gun you had was much better than the money spent on a gun you could have when you needed that money for other things like food, <laughs> clothing, um, maybe some form of habitation if you were in the city. And so again, the 1866 lever action continued to be in service and manufactured by Winchester way past even the introduction of the 1873 Winchester. And while percussion revolvers stopped being manufactured during the, uh, really when the cartridge became the thing around 1871 and 1873, that didn't mean that there weren't enormous amounts of percussion revolvers already in the field of people that knew and were comfortable with using them. And the reality is, either loading with loose paper, loose ball and, and, and primer and uh, powder isn't that big a deal, or having paper cartridges, which were still produced and you could buy them in little boxes, was not that different to the person in the field from a self-contained cartridge, as they didn't expect to be reloading their revolver under duress anyway. So this is why I go to say 1880, because even though we see the advent of self-contained cartridges in a really big production way in 1871, 72, and 73, and then we see more of that along with the Winchester company releasing their new 1873 Winchester in 44 Winchester centerfire, that's still 1873. The amount of people that are gonna transition from what they have to the new thing is still a small number. You're looking at new purchasers, people who are buying new guns, and you're looking for people that are particularly well healed and have a lot of money to upgrade their guns. But it wasn't that common to see that new stuff automatically adopted until it took a while. So this is why I go with 1880. In 1873, we see the advent of the 45 Colt and the 1873 Winchester. And about seven years later, that's why I'm going with 1880, we start seeing those be the common firearms in the field. And you may not necessarily encounter too many people still wielding a percussion revolver. However, you will still find lots of people still with 1860 and 1866 Henrys and Winchesters and 44 Rimfire, and those cartridges were manufactured up until the 1920s. That goes to show you how many of those guns were in the field and how calm they were in use, even though modern technology had surpassed 44 Henry Rimfire. In fact, 44 Henry Rimfire ultimately got uh, modernized into 44 Henry Centerfire, and there, is, there are a small amount of 1866 Winchesters in 44 Henry Centerfire. That's a video for another day. The point I'm making is, whether you had abandoned the field or the war was over for you, regardless of which side you were on, and you decided to go west to make a new life, because wherever you were wasn't for you anymore, um, you had what you had. You had a regulation holster that you modified to fit your cartridge or money belt. You probably had a percussion revolver that you were comfortable with and knew how to use and saw no reason to change. And if you were lucky, you had some sort of repeater like this 1866 Winchester chambered in 44 Henry Rimfire and therefore having a cartridge belt with a percussion revolver and wearing Apache boots wouldn't be that weird a thing in 1870 Arizona. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this kind of content. Guys, this is completely supported by viewers like you. It's you, the viewer, that keep InRange alive. Patreon.com slash TV makes it possible to do this sort of stuff that just doesn't get the kind of promotion that YouTube, GunTube tends to promote. Um, this is a very historically focused channel and culturally focused channel. And I'm thankful to all of you that support me via patreon.com slash TV to make that possible. Because this is the stuff, I hope you can tell, that I want to talk about.
hopefully you enjoyed this little poke into history and the reality of what I call the interim period, that migration from percussion to cartridge, and the reality of, you know, there are people still using surplus rifles and weapons today because they can afford them. And back in 1870, that was even more relevant than it was now. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more.